Let me tell you what was the motivating factors for how we put all this together. This group probably knows as well as any that healthcare is changing. Um, and with reform will come a new healthcare system that is very hard for small institutions to survive in. Let me take you back and tell you why I said that. The states and the federal government simply can't afford what healthcare costs. So what we have seen over the last five years is an inexorable decrease in what our revenues need to be to support the infrastructure that we have. And everyone across the country sees shrinking margins. And you look and you say, so who's doing well? What do you do to modify the way we deliver care in order to cope with an environment in which employers can't afford health care benefits, Medicare can't afford it, and Medicaid can't afford it. And those are our payers. Well, you've got to change the way we deliver health care. And what that fundamentally means is that we're moving away from fee-for-service medicine into what's been increasingly called population management or risk. The successful systems, like Kaiser, for example, aligns the insurance component with the medical component. The decisions are made by the MDs or their associates about whether care should happen or be denied. And quality measures are extremely important and side by side with efficiency. So now we look across the country and we see what systems are really effective. What systems can give you quality with efficiency? And the answer turns out to be it's the large integrated healthcare systems. Simplified care, shorter length of stay, better use of resources, and because of their size, better contracting for supplies and with insurance companies, and less expensive corporate services. And what else can those places do? They can have their own insurance product. So they can control the dollar, not at the very end stage where we are, you know, at the end of the food chain, but they can control the dollar at the beginning of the food chain. They can make money by keeping people well. How do you do that if you're even a single hospital like Mount Sinai? A single hospital like Mount Sinai, no matter how great our reputation, would never have the geographical coverage to be able to encompass a large population of patients and be able to manage that big population, accept the actuarial risk, and have all the services across a geographical region that is large enough to have an insurance product. But when you add Mount Sinai and its primary care doctors and its hospitals with Continuum and its primary care doctors and its hospitals, suddenly begin to get the scale that's necessary to have the coverage that's necessary to manage a population that is large enough that we can accept the risk and have facilities that are diversified enough that we can accept a population no matter almost where they live. We're going to be developing centers of excellence throughout the healthcare system. If you're a physician um, and you're at one of the uh, hospitals other than Mount Sinai, you know, your role in our medical school is going to be as important as any of the physicians who are based at Mount Sinai Hospital. So it's going to be a, a system that has excellence throughout the system. It's going to be a rising tide that lifts all boats. A lot of the doctors at Mount Sinai do research. We have, uh, we're one of the top research facilities, as I mentioned, in the country. And one of the things related to the research we do is testing new medicines. Testing new medicines for uh, patients who have diseases like cancer and heart disease and mental illness and so forth in which standard treatments are not working. Those patients look for the next generation of treatments to see if you know, they can be helped by the medicines literally of tomorrow. We will bring that to the table throughout the entire Mount Sinai health system. So be, whether it's education, it's clinical care or research, you know, we're uh, very hopeful and committed uh, to driving excellence throughout uh, the new system, and the School of Medicine is going to be the foundation of doing that.
But by and large, what we're looking at is the death of fee-for-service medicine, and what will come in its place is population management. Now, some of you may remember that sounds an awful lot like HMOs and capitation, and that failed in the 90s, so it will fail again. Here's why this time it's not going to fail again, and it's very different. When it was in the 90s, care coordination and care decisions were being driven by the insurance companies. You'd call up as a doctor, and they would deny care, because their business was denying care. That's where they're going to make their money. And they didn't have robust quality metrics. Now, for example, in the ACOs, there are robust quality metrics that have to be made before there are any shared savings. Additionally, and critically, the care coordination is provided by the care team. And to do that, the care team has to have a stake in the premium. And we can accept risk. And we've already done that and proven to ourselves we can do that with our own accountable care organization. Mount Sinai's accountable care organization now has 21,000 patients. It's a Medicare, for those who don't know, ACOs, part of the Medicare system. With the continuum hospitals, we'll have 15,000 more. That makes 36,000 patients, one of the largest ACOs in the country. Our ACO has been very successful because we have put care coordinators throughout the system and we have managed readmissions and ED visits enormously successfully. So we know we can manage risk. We know we can deal with shared savings. We're getting a lot of confidence around that. And I would suggest, I'd be very surprised if by 2015 January we don't have our own Medicare Advantage product and perhaps other joint insurance products. One of the real gems of this merger for us was the infirmary. We bring together two great brands, the Mount Sinai brand and the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. The possibilities to go national with that brand are extraordinary. You have an efficiency in running ORs, in running ambulatory centers, in providing ENT and ophthalmological procedures that really, from my point of view, is unparalleled. But we also see this as an amazing opportunity as we come together with our ENT departments and the, all the ENT from all the systems, the possibility, in fact, the likelihood, we should become the foremost ENT department in the country. Uh, currently, the Mount Sinai system at Mount Sinai Hospital, we have 1,000 house staff under our sponsorship. The Continuum system also has 1,000 uh, residents. By, the, by, by July 1, 2014, all of the continuum-based house staff will be sponsored by our School of Medicine, 2,000 house staff. So we will have the, probably the largest house staff program in the United States. The question going forward is, should the current training programs, and here I'm talking generally, maintain you know, separateness under our sponsorship, like there be two internal medicine residencies and so forth? Or in certain cases, should they be combined? And our principle going forward is that they should only be combined if they enhance quality in terms of getting the best medical students to come to our residencies. And the, um, it, it's, it's best in terms of their training. But in some cases, it might be better to combine the smaller programs to create one bigger program of higher quality. Our model going forward is to create centers of excellence throughout the system that meet the needs of the community. We already have recognized that in cancer, for example, together we will have a world-class program in cancer to offer great cancer care literally throughout the five boroughs of Manhattan. There's clear synergism there. The same is true for cardiac care. Patients will get, be able to get outstanding, unprecedented care in cardiac care by us doing things together. Brain diseases, neurological diseases, uh, behavioral health. I can go on and on on how we are, together we will be stronger than the sum of our 
uh, part. So you will see over time us developing centers of excellence or clinical institutes on, on the way we'll deliver care together. We are very strong in research. Uh, we're well within the top 20 in research dollars coming from the National Institutes of Health to our School of Medicine. In fact, uh, we're ranked number two in the country in research dollars per scientist. So it means that the scientists in our system compete with the very best scientists in the United States and the world. Patients with serious disease in which there's not available treatments look to come to academic medical centers to get treatments that are not yet available so that there is hope. Clinical trials that are at the cutting edge. Together, by having the medical school, the foundation of all the things that we do, we're going to be able to bring more and more clinical trials for patients who have refractory diseases related to cancer, heart disease, mental illness, neurological diseases, immunological diseases, and so forth. From the housekeepers to the CEOs, everybody should be aligned in the same direction. And that is to recognize that our fights are never with each other. Our fights are to convince the public that they're getting value for health care um, and to convince the payers that we deserve a fair share. Um, and that's going to increasingly be the public message we're going to have to put forward because you will see as even a modest bargain is reached between the Republicans and the Democrats over the budget, we will be the most vulnerable. We've already taken $900 billion in cuts in the last few years in Medicare. $900 billion. How much more can we take? And when will we start to realize that each other are not the enemies, but it's the payers that just really have decreased um, what is available to us? There's going to be one IRB approval process. In fact, we've made progress uh, in moving toward that, I expect that that'll be finalized within the next couple weeks so that if you get approval at one of the IRBs throughout our system, you'll have approval to do that study throughout the entire system. So you can imagine how that will expand the patient you know, pool for all of the uh, trials. We're starting to do an assessment of, of all the trials in the system to see um, you know, which trials are being funded by the National Cancer Institute and the Heart and Lung Institute and so forth and determine should we combine forces together in terms of enrollment or keep things separate. But what is definitely clear is that our capacity, as I was mentioning before, to do uh, large-scale trials and offer them you know, to our patients who need it most will be markedly enhanced and it will be user-friendly. Personalized medicine means a lot of different things to us at Mount Sinai. It starts out with what we call a patient-centric approach. And it's very important to understand what that really means. In our cancer center, for instance, it means that patients don't go from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor all over the hospital. It means we come to them. Now, personalized medicine means a lot more, though, to a research institution. Personalized medicine means that there are genomic footprints that we need to know that is going to help us make way better decisions about your care. Um, and that comes from our making uh, huge investments in genomics, uh, in the uh, ability to obtain information, obtain tissue, analyze the tissue, sequence the genome, but even more importantly, analyze the data with a big computer that you hear about Watson. Well, we got a computer that's about as powerful. I mean, it's a huge computer that can crunch numbers. And part of what that does for us is helps us to get a profile for what's best for a particular patient. We are now a system that discharges 40% of all the discharges on the island of Manhattan. We're a system with uh, 177,000 discharges, 2.5 million outpatient visits, 500,000 emergency room visits about 34,000 employees, and including the medical school, which is an integral part of the Mount Sinai Health System, $7 billion in revenue. We're the largest private employer in New York. We're the largest health system by dollars 
in New York State. We're one of the largest not-for-profits in the country. But that's not why we did it. We did this because medicine is changing. Um, I don't have to tell this group that has worked so hard for the survival of St. Luke's and the prospering of Roosevelt um, to realize how difficult healthcare economics is today. And at the same time, we have to be more efficient. We have to provide a higher quality and a higher standard than we've ever been asked to do before. So the winners are those systems that are going to be able to provide high quality, efficient, cost efficient care. That happens with size and scope. Our greatest enemy and the greatest enemy in healthcare is the status quo. Things will change around us. If we're in the vanguard of that change, we'll survive and thrive. But if we believe that the status quo is the way to go, we're going to find ourselves, like a lot of other hospital systems, including the great St. Vincent's healthcare system at one point, the largest bankruptcy in the history of healthcare in the United States. We're not going to let that happen as long as we understand that change is inevitable and we work together, not adversarially, to make sure that we have that change. The principle on how we will go forward is we will do things in the interest of quality and competitiveness when it comes to the uh, training programs. If, uh, for example, there are some smaller programs where it makes sense to integrate the programs in some fashion so it's of higher quality and more competitive to get the best uh, medical students to join our postgraduate uh, training programs, then we'll do that. Another key mission is research. Uh, we are one of the top uh, research medical schools in the country. Uh, this year, for example, our NIH funding uh, was about $220 million. Uh, that went up from about $195 million. Uh, that's, we're one of the few medical schools in the country that went up this year in, in funding from the NIH. Together, we're going to be able to offer our patients who have serious disease in which there's not available treatment, new treatments that are in development. We do a lot of clinical trials at Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, you do clinical trials uh, here. There are clinical trials that go on in St. Luke's and BI, but we're going to be able to expand that uh, dramatically as we develop centers of excellence across the system in diabetes, in heart disease, in cancer, in uh, diseases related to the immune system. As we move into risk and, con and accepting risk and population management, it becomes essential to put everybody on the same IT platform. As we talk about this as an integrated healthcare system, it's important that people be able to feel comfortable in any one of the hospitals. That an appointment in one hospital gives you credentials in every hospital and you can use the, the IT platform in every hospital. The EPIC platform is simply more robust than the ones that you have. Um, so we are going to be spending what is any place between 120 and 150 million dollars over the next five years to put everybody on EPIC. As we get better and better at prevention and wellness, and perhaps as society recognizes that the social safety net is important for the health care of its population, we have to focus much more intensively, not by counting the number of beds, but by looking at the services in an ambulatory platform that are going to keep people well, that are integrated in large systems um, that bring primary and specialists together, put them all on the same electronic medical record, are patient-centric, multidisciplinary, and bring care right to the patient. The emergency room can't be where patients with substance abuse get their, you know, their treatment. And so that's why we're looking at things like partial hospital programs and enhanced ambulatory uh, care to reduce that kind of uh, patient volume going to the emergency room. Um, we've been very, very concerned with improving the situation in all the ERs. We've just hired a, a new person um, who will be starting toward the end of November, December 1, whose job will be an MD to take a look at how we can improve performance across all the EDs what processes we can put in place to do that. Uh, we've got to have great EDs, and we've got to take a hard look at what we need to do to make sure that they're the EDs of choice for the communities that we're embedded in. In the new Mount Sinai healthcare system, the cuts that we have received by either sequestration, the ACA, 
um, or the two midnight rule just put into effect, over the next 10 years will cost us $1.8 billion. We're most vulnerable around GME and IME dollars. The combined health system has 2,000 residents. Arguably, we'd have to look at the precise numbers, we're the largest training program in the country. New York receives a disproportionately large amount of GME and IME dollars. It's always been a target. Should that happen, and some of the cuts that have already been proposed would have been in the neighborhood of $300 million in a year, would be devastating. So, to step back from that, because health care providers and health care policy makers and the governments all realize collectively that this system is unsustainable, we're moving away from it. We're moving away from fee-for-service medicine. The traditional get paid for everything you do is going to be extinct, particularly for places like ours within the next 10 years. Whether it's called global payments, bundled payments, which is really taking over in Massachusetts. Whether it's the accountable care organizations and shared savings, whether it's capitation, whatever it is, providers are gonna be put at risk going forward. That means we're no longer going to be paid for everything we do. There's no longer gonna be a margin for doing more. There's only going to be a margin for keeping people well and preventing admissions. We're moving now, because of our size and scope in the new system, to an integrated healthcare system. And an integrated healthcare system that has the size and the scope to be more efficient and to provide high quality for all the communities it serves, and as a consequence, to have a fiscally sound, sustainable business model. That's what we can do. That's what we can do when we're all together. It's not gonna be easy. The status quo is our biggest enemy. We have to change and reform in how we deliver care in order to be effective. Business as usual is not gonna work. But the good news is, because we're now so large, we have the capacity to be far more efficient. Uh, with, with the combination that we now have, there's gonna be one medical school, that's the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And uh, our model uh, going forward is uh, not a hub and spoke model, but that all of the member hospitals of the new Mount Sinai Health System are equally important to our medical school. Uh, it's not gonna matter where faculty uh, practice or do their research in terms of location. Uh, our medical students are gonna have rotations throughout uh, the system so that uh, the relationship is gonna be very tight. It's not gonna be like uh, an affiliate, there's, that there's the main hospital and then there are affiliate hospitals. All of the member hospitals are gonna be equally important to uh, the medical school. We know in medicine that quantity and quality are highly, highly correlated. And what that means is if you're gonna do six renal transplants in one place and 250 in another, and you're the patient and you need a choice, you wanna to go to the place that does 250. Most activities, other than those that are quantitatively small, need to be represented in all the major hospitals. Um, we were just talking about uh, a program in bariatrics and how to grow the bariatrics program here because our thought is that's an essential program here and we want to grow it. Um, so yeah, there'll be some consolidations. We can't afford to do mitral valve surgery everywhere, nor should we. It's not in the patient's best interest. On the other hand, there are other things we will have to do everywhere. When we talk about centers of excellence, we mean centers that are of such high expertise and high quality and great efficiency that they require a certain mass. Um, and there'll be centers of excellence here. And, and one of the key factors that lead to failure of mergers is to not integrate cultures, to respect one, one another's expertise, 
Uh, and so we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to make sure that that's not going to happen in terms of not merging the cultures. So we're, we're still somewhat in a learning curve as we, you know, visit uh, all the member hospitals and have town hall meetings like this. And we've had many, many uh, individual meetings and um, uh, w with all sorts of faculty and other staff. And so that's will continue. Uh, so I want to reassure you of that, that we're going to uh, learn. Uh, but we do think there's lots of opportunities in the mental health area, as I mentioned, will be one of the largest programs in the country. It's going to bring together expertise in almost every dimension of mental health care and research. So we think we can do great things together as we learn more about each other. 